everyone. You're listening to Axtrack, a podcast committed to examining and providing solutions for safety and occupational health in the workplace. My name is Holly. I'm a registered nurse and the host of Axtrack. Whatever role you play, this show is all about providing you with new knowledge that can take your organization to the next level. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to actually have you on the podcast. And um, you've been one of the guests that, that we've been thinking about. And so I'm so thrilled to get you here in the new year. Um, for those of you that that aren't aware of who I'm speaking with today, I've actually got Dr. Scott Shuri, and he's our chief medical officer here at Axiom Medical. And we're thrilled to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell us about how long you've been, been with us here at Axiom Medical. This is actually my two-year anniversary this month. Okay. So. And prior to being at Axiom, where were you before? Um, I was a medical director at uh, Memorial Hermann Health System, helping lead their uh, internal employee health program as well as their external facing occupational medicine retail division. Awesome. Well, yeah. we're thrilled to have you again. Well, one thing that, that caught my attention when November rolled around was the BLS numbers came out. And what caught my attention actually specifically were that whenever it was showing that for the total recordable health cases that were there, that they were unchanged for the private industry, and they came back at, you know, like 2.8 per 100 uh, full-time workers, despite all the advancements in automation and, you know, mm-hmm. safety initiatives etc um, and so this is actually the first year since 2012 that we haven't seen a decline in mm-hmm. those stats nor did we have any decreases in the days away from work or the job transfer and restriction cases so were you aware of that you know I um, I loosely follow that I don't that's not on my like you know quarterly radar but I do you know get sentiments from industry sure. about kind of occupational injury and then even occupational illness yeah well one of the things that that came to my attention whenever I was looking at that and especially looking at some of the statements that came out after that were ASA ASSP came out and said that you know these numbers are basically unacceptable and they really pushed that focus for total worker health and so you know that took my attention to okay let's talk about this total worker health mm-hmm. concept because it seems like that we've got this term that here but not everyone knows what what we're referring to so maybe you can kind of explain for the audience what total worker health is yeah that's a great question you know and um, it's actually been out now a few years so you almost can't say that it's new but it's still a kind of a um, a concept that um, isn't strongly uh, defined by by NIOSH Um, it's really a concept that helps kind of push us in a way in the industry to really broaden how we look at um, employee health. So um, total worker health is really defined as uh, kind of the uh, the way occupational health used to be looked at as health protection. So it's your classic safety, industrial hygiene, and occupational medicine really focused on work-related um, health, um, health and hazard um, exposures. And then the new part to it, the other, the, the second side to it is really health protection or health promotion. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really the uh, programs and services that focus on individual health that's maybe not necessarily coming from the workplace exposures, but still drastically affect workplace performance and productivity, things like that. So you can think of it as preventive medicine. Um, and so really it's, it's these two types of um, issues or, or concepts brought together as one. And so what's interesting, um, kind of the history of occupational health or occupational medicine is it's kind of come full circle. Sure. Um, you know, decades ago, um, I heard where, you know, the clinics or the health services on site would just do everything for the right. employees, you know, so they would come in for anything that um, they had a need for and they they really never differentiated between work related and personal mm-hmm. and the company didn't really care they had you know doctors nurses techs um, you know great support staff that would just really handle everything and then over the years there was kind of this focus on let's be more uh, intentional about how we spend money on the health the, on on employee health mm-hmm. and so you know probably you know, 15, 20 years ago, there started to be this delineation about, well, this is, we're going to cover work-related kind of um, cost through the on-site clinics and then use your personal health insurance for, for non-work-related. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I think we're realizing that 
there, that's not working well, so we need to re come back full circle and say we need a, a, a comprehensive program that addresses both because, you know, we have 24 hours in a day. Most people work eight or longer hours in a day, and you sleep eight hours in a day, so you're spending a third to half of your waking hours at the, at the work site, so. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us then about some how, where did this concept originate? So you said that, that uh, you know, we initially were at that stage and then we kind of moved away from that. So was it NIOSH then that brought this up or where, where did this, this term total worker health come from? Correct. So, you know, NIOSH is the research wing of the CDC for uh, occupational health. And so they're really the champions from a government policy perspective on um, on these types of issues. So they're the ones that have coined that term and they're the ones that are promulgating uh, concepts. And I wouldn't call them standards yet because it's really a voluntary kind of program. You know, the health, the health protection component that um, is really largely uh, promulgated by OSHA, those are, those are medical or federal standards that are really federal law in effect. Right. So you, we have to comply based on um, regulatory guidance, but mm -hmm. the health promotion side is still voluntary. So what would be the significance of acknowledging the risk factors that are related to work that contribute to health problems that would consider, you know, considered to be unwork related previously? Um, you, you know, so what they're finding is, um, you know, the workforce isn't as maybe productive or as um, reliable in the, in the sense of how I see it with um, a lot of people having personal medical issues that are affecting them at the workplace. Uh, a lot of people actually don't even know they have medical conditions right. that are affecting them. It can be very um, just, just slow onset and so people start feeling worse and worse but it's very s slow to manifest and so they, 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 they feel like they're feeling normal, but then, you know, they're drowsy, um, you know, they're just less productive. And, and so, especially with em employee populations that are performing physically demanding work or safety sensitive work, that, that can really impact one operations uh, from a productivity perspective, but our biggest concern is their safety, right? right. So, so maybe like truck drivers with sleep apnea and things of that sort. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, you know, um, different um, employee populations have different risk factors based on kind of the type of work they're doing. Sure. But what we're seeing is uh, the chronic medical conditions that drive most of the healthcare spend um, can be really um, exacerbated in some of these employee populations. So shift work, mm -hmm. uh, sedentary work, but still worrying or, you know, driving long distances, you know, uh, mm -hmm. formal truck drivers, yeah. etc. So some of the health conditions then that would impact some of these things that they're doing in their daily work with those, some of those conditions then, would that include obesity? Would that include diabetes? What, what type of conditions specifically? Exactly. So, um, I would say really the most common ones are just what you named, uh, mm -hmm. obesity, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Okay. Um, and so a lot of the components of total worker health are kind of just know your numbers, what's your blood pressure, what's your blood sugar, which is which is addresses diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, what's your cholesterol, things like that. Okay, awesome. So tell us then maybe what are some of the benefits for workers specifically moving towards this concept? For, um, for workers, for employees, um, you know, and maybe it's a, a selection bias that I got when I would see people in the clinic uh, at a work site is that they thought of me as their doc, like sure. they didn't go to any other doc. So um, it was interesting for me because some of these employees were, you know, across all age groups. So you might have someone in their 40s, 50s and 60s that you know, is not really having their own primary care doctor that they can develop a rapport with and, and really make sure that their health is optimized. So um, for, for employees out there that have no, no uh, engagement with the health system personally or even work-related, they may n know nothing about actually their health. And so mm -hmm. what's interesting is m most people know they need to maintain their car, they need to get checkups for their equipment, um, obviously, our hobbies we really enjoy, so we're yeah. always on top of that. Sure. But very rarely do we look in inwardly at our at our body as one of the most sophisticated pieces of machinery on the planet. So, um, you know, having uh, a total worker health approach will allow uh, a huge 
proportion of employees that seek no medical care or no medical prevent preventive maintenance, so to speak, to kind of get that part of their um, uh, as part of their assessment. And and so what's so crucial is is if you can catch things early, it can dramatically affect the outcome. So if you can catch somebody with just elevated blood sugar before they're diabetic, you know, you can quickly make changes. Uh, same thing with blood pressure. You know, the when I was in med school, they called, you know, high blood pressure the silent killer. Right. And so basically you felt fine. And then by the time you, you know, you realized you had high blood pressure, it was 30 years later, your heart was enlarged mm -hmm. and you're at high risk for heart attack. So really it's just kind of getting that early, um, uh, that early opportunity to make sure you're doing well and it's yeah. periodic and I really like the analogy there with with the maintenance especially with the cars from an automobile standpoint yeah. you know it really makes a lot of sense and I think that people can relate to that well thinking about it then shifting gears and looking at it from the employer standpoint what would the benefits be there you know for the employer there's actually a lot of benefits as well um, you can look at them across different um, different departments I, I always look at for the employer you know there's different departments which their human resource effects so uh, in summary really it would be you know you're optimizing your human resource so really you know our companies are really our, our people made up of people and that really sure. is what makes the difference so you know our human resource is really our most important resource and so there's a lot of energy by the company to hire uh, train, attract, and, and, and ret uh, retain, you know, terrific talent. So um, what happens with uh, employees that need to be doing physically demanding work or safety sensitive work, um, or even sedentary office workers, if, if they're having a lot of issues with personal medical that's bringing them out of the workforce, so absenteeism, you know, that, that can be greatly improved by having a, a total worker health uh, approach. Um, you know, so, um, and at the same time, if they're not feeling well, but still coming into work, that you know, you can greatly improve presenteeism, mm -hmm. and that's where people are, you know, at work, but they're not as engaged as they could be. Sure. Um, and then, you know, from a monetary perspective, you can look at short-term disability, long-term disability, and even workers' compensation mm -hmm. uh, cost and rates. And so, and I would think that that would also potentially impact their injury records as well, because I mean, if you have exactly. a, a fit workforce, then obviously they're they're not as likely to yep. be injured on the job. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, what are some of the the issues that are relevant to advancing worker well being through this total worker health? You know, I think it's uh, a new concept. So, um, and it doesn't have specific guidance per se, so it's left really for every company to kind of look at what their needs are and kind of you know implement what they see as most important to them. And so since there's not a mandate to do it and there's not specific guidance, you know, that may um, kind of see this slow start to adopt total worker health. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also think it's just a, a huge cultural shift. Sure. And. Um, uh, you know, so th those are the things that I've kind of uh, seen in, in my in my perspective on you know what's been holding up total worker health implementation. So, from an opinion basis, I mean, do you think that this is where we will we will ultimately end up? Is that this will be something that will be mandated, or they're not? That it's it's hard to say. Um, I actually rotated through OSHA as a mm -hmm. medical resident, and it was very really interesting to see the political. Um, the political perspectives of OSHA and the legal perspective, because right. um, you know, I'm I'm thinking back to social studies class and how how does a a bill become a law? Right. And someone told me, well, an OSHA standard doesn't go through that process, and so it goes through a whole other process that I'm really not uh, an expert on. But basically, if an OSHA standard is passed, it's considered federal law. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of lobbying and a lot of input from industry, and I and I do understand when an OSHA uh, standard is passed it does incur a lot of cost to industry sure. and things like that but um, I, I think one thing that we're recognizing in America is our health outcomes on average are just mediocre or poor for the amount of money we're spending and I would say that's for personal medical and um, potentially occupational so there needs to be some kind of synergy of those two health systems working more effectively together. So um, 
I'm, I'm optimistic that, that, that this will be the, the future. Right. So l- taking a step back then and, and looking from the broader picture. So for those organizations that haven't implemented this type of concept or they don't even know where to get started, where would you say that that, that, that beginning point would be? Where would they start? You know, so there's, um, I'll call, you know, there's, there's two options in my mind. There's kind of the self-help option and then there's the seek professional help uh, option. So the self-help option, uh, you know, you can go to the, the web and, and look up NIOSH or Total Worker Health and they have toolkits that can um, help guide, you know, companies, institutions, leaders uh, to kind of get a sense of what they need. Um, you know, I'm probably a little bit biased because I'm in the field, but, sure. um, you know, I, th- I think, you know, hiring uh, or engaging a, a professional consultant or a, a partner that can help, you know, um, with o- your occupational health needs mm-hmm. that has experience with the to- total worker health approach is really the most efficient way. Um, a lot of friends of mine will go to Google <laughs> to kind of right. Google their med- medical issues and then they'll come to me after and say, um, I don't know if that was helpful or not, you know, mm-hmm. but the, the NIOSH um, toolkits out there are, are, you know, really good about giving you the big concepts, but still there's a lot of work that needs to be done at each organization to really determine their needs. So there may be health risk, you know, so you're looking at this from a population health perspective where you're looking at, you know, maybe injury rates, but also your your prevalence of certain chronic medical conditions across your populations because you want to really everyone has limited resources you know whether you're a huge fortune 500 corporation or you know a mom and pop kind of uh, company but you want to focus on you know two or three of the 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 biggest um, difference makers you can in your population health approach Mm -hmm. so um, you know I, I think once you kind of open up that toolbox and start kind of getting a sense of what's all included you're gonna you're still gonna need to partner with um you know uh, an option that can help really bring um the expertise and the operational approach from a, a healthcare perspective so you'll definitely need someone to oversee this piece and typically yes. whether that's internal or external right you'll need somebody that's that's able to come in and assess your population determine what your specific needs are and then also help you to implement some of these tools is, is then maybe what, I, what i'm hearing you say. correct yeah mm-hmm. yeah okay and so how so when people are whenever they do start this how would you say to them that they would gauge their effectiveness how so, could they measure things so, like that? Um, you know, gauging program effectiveness, you can think about it as, uh, I think the classic approach is leading indicators and lagging indicators. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, leading indicators can be um, program participation rates, just make sure you're, you know, get, get a sense of um, how many of your folks are actually participating in these programs. Um, and then lagging indicators are really where the, the true outcome is being measured. Right. Um, you know, I would say it would be some of the things we talked about before um, that can really affect employee or the employer perspective. So looking at just the prevalence of chronic medical conditions before and after this intervention. So what's the number or the percentage of employees with you know, obesity, diabetes, right. high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, and then also looking at those um, employer perspectives, so uh, short-term, long-term disability rates, workers' comp rates, you had mentioned just the injury rate itself. Mm-hmm. And so those are things that I think would be kind of a, a broad approach. And then depending on your specific resources you're targeting, whether it's smoking cessation, um, you know, exercise, um, there's just really the full gamut of, of health promotion out there. So depending on you know which pieces you're you're actually targeting on i would have those as a, a uh, lagging indicator okay yeah. and then one other piece that that i was just thinking about while we were discussing is how do you address this then from an employer standpoint of the personal health information how does this cross over because it seems like that that would be a hot topic of you know you're asking employees to give information but that is personal health information that you're you're asking them to give correct and and so i think the <laughs> You know, this isn't an easy uh, issue to um, tackle, but the easiest way that I've seen in the in the past is if your employees are willing to 
release their information and the companies are doing you know annual health risk appraisals in over and in additional to the occupational medicine requirements right. that's the easiest and that's how the program usually is most effective because you have all the information at your hand so you can really prov perform analytics to see where you're effective where you need to double down uh, y you know but I know in, in this day and age people's privacy is is important to them so there there probably are some other unique ways to where you have um, if, if, if you know the major, you know if not everyone's willing to sign a release to have their information shared for this program having um, a very targeted approach so you may have on the health protection side so the classic Ahmed safety and industrial hygiene component um, that part you know most companies are doing well and then it's just being able to interface with the personal medical side from the health insurance plan but they can usually provide uh, de-identified information about big picture um, you know, you know uh, uh, epidemiology so to speak sure. so having you know what's your prevalence of, of those chronic medical conditions and are they changing over time mm -hmm. without without um, divulging individual information, information so you can have a, a tiered employees. approach yeah. and but that is a challenge because those systems are very different and privacy laws are, are, are different yeah. so that's a good question yeah. Well, thank you for the information. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about specifically that, that you feel like that we should we should address? No, I felt like that's a pretty... Uh, it's kind of an of, overview of standard. Yeah, it's a pretty good yeah, overview yeah. Of, of total worker health and yeah. some of the, the benefits and challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I definitely think that this will be something that we'll be exploring more this year, especially, um, you know, as, as an organization, because obviously we want to be advocates for, for you know, moving this forward, you know, advancing the, the purpose and the cause and, and helping other organizations to be able to, mm -hmm. you know, take care of their employees in the best way that's possible. So I think that we'll be drilling down and maybe into some of these individual, mm -hmm. um, you know, pieces that come along with us. But I think that this is a great start and, and we appreciate your insight. You know, I think it's just like, uh, the classic first person on the dance floor but as you're closing I, I one thing did pop into my mind so I just like to share you know total worker health is is, is a, a very large um, program to implement at one time so mm -hmm. you know I think it's very appropriate for companies who are just starting on this process to even you know look what's out there find a good resource but you know maybe just implement one one or two pieces of this at a time and and, sure. and slowly start going uh, sometimes there can be this overwhelming effect with a new yeah. project a new corporate project so um, you know it could be just uh, you know a small slice of total worker health and start start moving forward that mm -hmm. way so that's probably my only suggestion for people that for leaders um, and for companies that aren't sure if they really want to go down this path since it's not a, a mandatory program yet so maybe something along the lines of implementing, you know, annual wellness or something along those lines, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you again. I appreciate your help. And, and like I said, I'm sure we'll be following up with you in the future um, as we, we dig it on. This, this well, it's been my pleasure and thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. If you'd like to improve your own occupational health program, we invite you to contact Axiom Medical at 877-502-502. 9466 or visit our website axiom axiomllc.com